Um, welcome to the Spotlight stage um, this afternoon. We have a very uh, special guest, um, <laughs> Graham Park. Um, DJ Hello. Graham Park, the legend who has done it all in the music industry with over 30 years uh, of DJing and his career basically mirroring the evolution of uh, dance music and, and club culture. So from a residency at the Hacienda to an international touring live and radio career, and most recently the Hacienda Classical Show, this man needs no introduction. So thank, thanks so much for being with us. Well, today. thanks for having me. Um, I painted a little bit of a, a picture of your, uh, of your your career there, but would you mind um, starting us off with uh, how how it all began? And, uh... Yeah, well, I ne never ever at any point in my life before becoming a DJ wanted to be a DJ. I used to play in bands, uh, sing in bands, play saxophone in bands, and I was in a record shop in Nottingham, and that's all I wanted to do, just like playing bands. Hope, hope to give up the record shop one day to focus on playing in a band, but then the owner of the record shop, um, the late Brian Selby, the record shop was selected in Nottingham. He bought a nightclub and said that he wanted me to DJ in the club. And I was 18 or 19 and loved my job in the record shop, so I was okay. Reluctantly agreed to do it and very quickly thought, hang on a minute, I love doing this because basically I was getting paid extra money from my uh, record shop job to play music that I really loved and people seemed to love dancing to the music I played and unlike being in a band I didn't have to do uh, hire a transit van and set the equipment up and do sound checks and split the money with the rest of the band it was just two crates of records and all the money was mine so I thought, yes, this is the life for me. So I thought, I'll give it a go. And that was 1984. And here we are, 38 years later. Bloody hell. Uh, and I'm still doing it. Amazing. So, um, so you ended up, um, ended up working, DJing the nightclub in, in Nottingham. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I started off in the, the Garage Club in Nottingham on Wednesdays and uh, Saturdays. Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, but then it was just Wednesdays and Saturdays. And then uh, word kind of started to spread around the East Midlands. So I started doing uh, a club in Derby called the Blue Note. And then the, there was a club in Leicester called the Fan Club that I used to do. And then uh, the Lead Mill, which has been in the news recently because it's uh, futures under threat, I ended up doing Wednesday nights in Lead, at the Lead Mill in Sheffield. And then in 1988, I started doing um, Hacienda in, in Manchester. So between 84 and 88, it was literally word of mouth. People hearing about this, well, I used to be skinny, I was a skinny, bald Scottish guy, um, playing music that no one else was playing. And crucially, back in the day, um, a lot of DJs used the mic in between the records. Um, so not doing that, not, not doing what people expected, Word spreading round. So in the end, it was Wednesdays, Sheffield, Thursdays, Leicester, Leicester, Friday, Manchester, Saturday, um, Nottingham. And Sundays, I used to be part of the, there was a big Midlands all day, a soul and funk all day scene. And I quite often ended up doing that on a Sunday as well. So yeah, considering it's not something I ever planned on doing, it kind of worked out pretty well. And that was in, you know, between 84 and 88. Amazing. And in, in that period, what um, what music were you playing and how did that evolve? Well, because I never planned on being a DJ, I just played what I liked. And at the time, so in the early 80s, um, I used to play, see, I, my mum my used to listen to uh, soul music, like Motown and Stax. So I loved that. So I thought it was quite easy to play that. I loved that. Um, and I loved, I always loved um, like kind of electro pop. And, and lots of bands in the early to mid 80s, there was always a 12 inch club mix, so like ABC, Low Monkeys, uh, Human League, New Order. And then uh, I was a bit of a punk rocker in the 70s. I loved that kind of American new wave thing, like Talking Heads, Blondie. And, and, and you know, because Talking Heads and Blondie did kind of vaguely disco records, and I was also the second hand buyer. 
at the, at the record shop I worked in. So I kept, I kept that going until I started in Hacienda. Um, old, obscure disco stuff as well. So it was a real eclectic mix of stuff, which in recent years I've gone back to um, on the radio and in, and, in, and in some gigs. So it was a real mix of everything. And then of course in 1986, as the, I was not only the single, uh, the second hand buyer, I was also the singles buyer. And all these obscure 12 inch records from Chicago started to appear. And that was like when House Music came along, and you could say it took over. Well, it did take over. And I guess um, in those early days when you were when you playing those those records, some pe- most people probably hadn't heard them, a lot of the records you were playing before. Well, well, the thing is, it was all about just creating a great kind of vibe and a good kind of atmosphere, and, and, and it really didn't matter what you played. People just expected to come along and enjoy themselves. So. I was always like playing new stuff in with the kind of old stuff and the, the more well-known stuff. Um, but when house music came along, it, it was a trickle of the odd uh, record from Chicago and Detroit. But by the end of 1987, it was like 10, 15 records a week. And they were all amazing because they were really raw. It was like... like it sounded like disco music because it was made with cheap synthesizers and drum machines. It had this rawness. I mean, the one that really stuck out to me in the beginning from 1986 was a record called Music is the Key by J.M. Silk. And what struck me about that, and if anyone listens to that record, it's a Steve Soul Curly production. It's very monotonous electronic beat. And Keith Nanali, the soul vocalist, sings on it and it's this this kind of really sharp contrast between minimal raw monotonous electronic synth sequences and drums and keith nanali's beautiful um soulful voice on the top and to me i'm like oh this is incredible um so i had to start playing more and more of this stuff and what happened was half of the crowd were like why are you playing this stuff we don't want it but the other half are like, wow, this new stuff is incredible. And I stuck with my gut. And that's what, what I've done for the past 30 years. I've always just stuck with my gut. I mean, just because a record's popular doesn't mean I'm going to play it. I, don't like, I, I genuinely, after all these, I still can't. If I don't like a song, I don't care how big it is, I just can't play it. And I've always been like that. So I went with my gut, which was this stuff that they're calling house music is amazing. Um, and... The people who didn't like it, then eventually they would find other places to go. But word spread and more people would come. And then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, I ended up at Hacienda on a Friday with Mike Pickering. And I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. 2,000 people um, going completely wild to brand new music every week that they'd never heard before. It was incredible. And... When, so when you got to the Hacienda, was the first time, was it the first time you went there when you DJed there, or did you go um, it, When I worked in the record shop and played in bands, I was a massive factory records fan. I, I mean, huge factory records fan. And I used to get the train up. When, when they opened the Hacienda, which is 40 years ago, May the 21st, 1982, and it was like, and reading them sounds and enemy, the, the factory records were opening a nightclub. Couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my God, I've got to go with that. So I used to get the train up to, to Manchester from Nottingham to see bands, and it was like a live venue. And I went to a club night once, Greg Wilson was DJing, and, and although he played great music, it wasn't a club night, people just stood around looking moody. I, I mean, this is like early 80s, so a lot of men with fringes and uh, max, right? And not much dancing going on. Um, when I met Mike Pickering in 1987, at an ID magazine photo shoot, and we hit it off, he was aware of what I was doing in Nottingham. I was aware of him through Quando Quango and Tikoi Records, but also because of, he was a DJ at Hacienda. He said, oh, we should do something. We had this, we, had, we both agreed that uh, the media was very London-centric, well, it still is, but it was very London-centric then, and didn't, wasn't acknowledging that north of Waterford there was this thriving acid house scene, right? I know there's this story about some people in London who went and discovered it in Ibiza, yeah, they could have saved themselves a lot of money in time by going up the M6 because it was already happening up there. So we, we thought we'd go on a night and invite the media. 
And, and so he said, come up and DJ. That was a, Wednesday, a Tuesday night in February, 88. And all the media came up and went, oh my God, this is amazing. And it, so that was, that, to me, that, that was like the first time I'd witnessed a good club night in there. But in May, when Mike asked me to cover for him, when he went on holiday, he said, you've got to come up, though. Things have changed. And what do you mean things have changed? Was, I can't explain. If you don't come up, you're not covering for me. So I got the train up to Manchester. And I walked in the club, and I could see exactly what he meant. The, <laughs> everyone had this really wild look in their eyes, like a wild look I'd never seen before. And everyone has seemed to have lost all sense of how they, how, of, of any style because it was all dungarees and baggy t-shirts and the smiley logo everywhere and bandanas but this wild look in everyone's eyes and the atmosphere was intense it was just like I'd never witnessed anything like it I go into the DJ box door knock on the door and Mike answers the door and he's got this wild look in his eyes as well and Mike and he's like come in come in he gets this massive sweaty hug I'm like what's going on he goes You've got to have this, and everything will become clear. 20 minutes later, I'm on the dance floor, and he played The Party by Craze, and immediately everything became clear. And that was the, the, the difference. You know, the, the stars aligning, you know, Acid House, Detroit Techno, this amazing um, building, industrial club designed by Ben Kelly, and then this little girl called Ecstasy. And that's when things really kind of next level is this day. So then I did it for three weeks. Mike came back and said, look, I heard it was great. Do you want to come and do the Friday with me? And that, and that was it. I was there until 1997 when it closed. So that, that, that early night at that, the Hansi and the Sound was incredible. But how do, you, how do you feel like the energy from those early nights kind of differs to, to, similar, to similar nights like that? Now? Well, you see, things go in cycles, don't they? And I sometimes now get booked to play events where everyone's under very, and I'm seen as this kind of heritage, the old great part from Hacienda. And to be honest, if I take my glasses off, I can't really see properly. I, I could be the Hacienda, especially the warehouse projects in Manchester. We do, we do, we've done a few Hacienda club nights there, and eighty percent of the audience weren't born when the Hacienda got knocked down, and that was 97, right? And they just don't care, they don't care what you play as long as it's good, right? There's, they haven't got this baggage about, oh, come on. There's, there's nothing more annoying than some middle-aged cover. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a middle-aged DJ, I'm not knocking it, there's a lot of middle-aged covers. Clockwork Courage events are brilliant. But the ones that clamber up to the DJ box, right? When the place is going wild, are you playing? a mix of new stuff and kind of maybe the more obscure old stuff. And, and someone will go, Parky, get some proper classics on. And, and that's just the women, right? <laughs> that's a terrible joke. It's true though. That's how they talk in the North. You're all from the South. You don't, you never go North, do you? Um, no, but it, it's like, well, what, what do you mean get some proper classics on? They just want to hear the, the, the tunes that, that bring back memories. But the energy in the Rare Earth Project, to go back to your question, it's just loads of young people. And the smiley logos reappeared and the baggy stuff's reappeared, which I think is terrible, personally. But it's, it's, it's essentially the same. The, the only difference is the Hacienda was this kind of organic thing that happened. It was never planned to be like this kind of revolutionary acid house venue. It just happened. Um, Whereas the warehouse project is as close as you get to it, but it's still, oh, let's do something that's like a warehouse party or like an illegal rave. So it's a bit more contrived, but the energy is still the same. And like I say, Clockwork Orange events, we get the older clubber, the ones who have, their kids have gone to university or their kids have left school and they've got a bit of, bit of wedge. They're all out clubbing again. That's brilliant, I think, because it's like my generation. We haven't really grown up. And in fact, in my other life as a, you may or may not know, I'm a senior lecturer. I'm doing some proper research at the University of Manchester on this um, demographic of middle-aged covers who are back out again. It's fascinating stuff. It's amazing. Um, 
So I think uh, you know, we kind of touched on earlier how maybe, um, back back then in the hustle in the days, people were coming and they, they hadn't heard a lot of the chats before. It was the first time, the first time they'd heard them. Um, do you think that that kind of feeling of discovery can be recreated in the current? I, th- I think, yeah, I think so, because back then, DJs like me, if you were very lucky, you'd get um, an acetate. I wrote a company, my cut five, no more than five acetates. And then I would have the acetate for six weeks. Then the white label, no, the test pressing would come. And the test pressing is B50. So then there's only another 50 copies of it. And then a few weeks later, the promo. And there'd be like maybe two or three hundred of those. So from getting the acetate till the record got released, it could be three, four months. By then, if I haven't played a record for three or four months in Hacienda, um, I mean, a good example is, and it's a record I really struggle to play now because it's, it's, a, great, it's a great record. It's come on, it's not, there's other great records. Robin S has shown me love. I got the acetate at that. Six months until it came out. By then, I'm fed up with it. And everyone in Hacienda was fed up with it. So you move on because there's so much new stuff. And, and people couldn't get hold of those records that a few DJs had. And it was, it was really exciting. Some DJs would go the lines of covering up the label. But I never bothered with that because I thought, well, I want you to know what you can't have. You know what I mean? Um, but now every, everyone can have anything, which is good. But it, it makes, for me personally, it makes me work harder to find things that are a bit harder to find or that the other DJs or maybe aren't looking at, but it's just different times. It's just that the, the method of delivery, it costs a lot of money to manufacture records and, and record companies wouldn't invest in music unless they thought it was worth investing in. Whereas the difference is now, anybody, anybody with a laptop with basic music software can make something and, and put it out the same day. Great. It democratizes the whole process. But God almighty, there's some right old shite out there, isn't there? <laughs> no, but the thing is, I'm not mourning because in amongst all that, there's some great stuff. Just got to know where to look, says the person who launched Hacienda Records this week. <laughs> we did, though, by the way. Hacienda Records launched this week. Amazing. Nice. And we're going to put out really good stuff. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Right, in lockdown, um, I was doing my digging through uh, music and uh, a friend of mine who has been making records for years, Charles Schillings, great producer from France, he always sends me stuff. And there was one track that I thought was incredible. And I was like, Charles, this is brilliant. Robert Owens sings on it. This is brilliant. Uh, who's, when's it coming out? Who's releasing it? He said, it's not signed to anyone. I went, well, that's interesting. And I, and I remember putting the phone down going, I'd love to sign that. And I thought, well, maybe I should, maybe I should sign it. And then I thought, hang on, I need to talk to Peter Hook because he owns that's the enemy. And, I, and he said, yeah, okay, let's do it. You, you, you run it. So uh, we decided to put it off till this year because it's the 40th anniversary of that's the enemy. So the first release came out on Wednesday. It's called Me Time by Charles Schillings and Robert Owen. It's available on all digital platforms with final to follow. And then the second single is out in four weeks, that's a, like an amazing track by Soul Central. It's like nothing you've heard before. And the whole plan is to put out records that are good when I find them. So we're not gonna be doing one release a month. Some people do, great, good, good luck to you. When I find something that's really good, that I think is deserves to be heard, we'll release it. So who knows when the first release is. It will be this year. It's great. Love that. Well, that's the plan. Whether it makes money or not, I don't. I don't know. I don't care to be honest. I just want to share these great records that aren't being shared elsewhere. Fantastic. So, as the Hassi, after Hassi and the exploded, um, the opportunity came around. I'd love to be another Joe. Say it never exploded. It got demolished. But sorry. <laughs> um, you got the opportunity to to go to America. Um, what, what was that like? Oh, nineteen eighty nine. Um, Peter Hook comes in the DJ box and goes, right, you're coming to America with us. You're going to support New Order on tour. What? I've literally been DJing at Hacienda for like 
less than a year, and Peter Hu, one of my kind of top heroes, is telling me, not asking me, telling me that I'm going to go and support New Order on their uh, North American tour. Uh, Public Image Limited, the Sugar Cubes, me on the decks, and the New Order. I couldn't believe it. And, and I, we, we did like Boston, New York, Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. I was there for like weeks. Uh, and then Mike, I mean, Mike and I saw to Mike McCready went over and he did the, the Southern States. I couldn't believe that. I was like, I think this DJ might, might well be something I shall pursue for a while. And it's literally getting paid to party around North America with a band that I was a big fan of, a big fan of, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and that's where they started to kind of take off, really. Amazing. And was it, was it a big party at Adam and at St. Lawrence when you were there? From what I can remember, yeah, I think it was. No, it wasn't. The thing is, I remember being very excited to meet John Lydon, because, you know, in 1977, I was 14, and discovered the clash and the band and the Sex Pistols, etc. That was a bit of a disappointment. John but I met Bjork, this mad crazy woman called Bjork, who sang the Sugar Cubes. Um, and then, then me DJ to a bunch of long haired uh, goths with eyeliner who didn't understand why some bald guy with a baggy t shirt was playing Black Box before New Order came on. And then when New Order came on, I got to watch three or four songs, then I I a limousine, and I mean a limousine would take me to the after party venue where I started DJing. And it was, there was a lot of, um, well, let's just say, the six weeks I got very involved in the whole process, shall we say. It's amazing, I can believe it. Amazing. And, um, how much of an influence do you think the Hacienda had on, on the US side of it? Culture. I don't know, you see, I, North America didn't really get kind of clubbing, like commercial, popular house music clubbing until about 10 years ago, really. Um, but there was a great there was a great scene of underground, less well-known clubs. For example, um, DJing at the Sound Factory in New York in the late 80s and 90s was really exciting. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, I just remember. The Mars Club, which doesn't exist anymore in New York, I did monthly Sundays there because Mark Caymans, the late Mark, Mark Caymans, who produced Quando um, Quango with Mike Bickley, came to Hacienda and said, right, you're coming to DJ at the Mars Club. And I did monthly Sundays for about 18 months. That was really exciting. We've seen you know, all those clubs have gone now. I mean, New York, famous for, for nightclubs, they've all, they've all gone. DJ at the Smart Bar in Chicago, and meeting Marshall Jefferson when I was on tour in New York, that was a buzz. That's when I thought, yeah, maybe I'll give this, maybe it is a career choice. My dad was so couldn't believe I'd give, given up a job at a record shop to be a DJ. He gets it now, <laughs> in his 80s. Yes. Was, the, um, was the vibe like in the clubs similar to what was going on in my yeah, club, 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 club vibes are club vibes, aren't they? It, it, as long as you've got a great selection of music, a decent sound system, and an up for a crowd. You could be anywhere. We could tell, we could have, I mean, it's not packed in here, but we could have a, get, get some tunes on. We could have a nice little session here in the afternoon. Um, it, it's all down to the DJ. And, and when, I, when, I, when I started DJing, and I still, it still bugs me, it was more, it was all, the music was always more important than the DJ. And then at some point in the early 90s, this kind of superstar DJ thing happened. And it became more about the DJ. And, I, and I still, I'm still not comfortable with that. I'm, I, I remember back in the day at the Garage Club in Nottingham, my, my DJ period, I had to climb through a hole and I was kind of up. And you could hardly see who, who was DJ. But everyone loved it. Nobody was, had smartphones. Everyone was just dancing. And I kind of miss those days, because now it's like spotlights and dressing rooms and artists liaison. I mean, it's great. I mean, it, it makes, if, I'm in my 50s, anything that makes the process easier is fantastic. But I do miss that kind of, you're just some bloke who puts the tunes on. 
and he, and, and really, and I st- you should only you're only as good as your last set, I think. Whereas now, if you look at social media, everyone's amazing all the time, but that's just not true, is it? I just think I do miss those days. And I, but, but there are clubs. I mean, I just look over there. There's a, um, a friend of mine who owns a sub club. That is um, one of my favourite clubs because it is going back to that kind of dingy, low ceiling, and everyone's on the dance floor. Yeah. Um, so, like, obviously, the Hacienda continues to remain really relevant um, 20 years after it closed its doors. What do you think? Uh, what do you think it was about the Hacienda there? Yeah, well, there, there was honestly. I mean, I, I, I'm can be accused of being biased, but there really was nothing like it. I'd spent many years clubbing and I'd been DJing for a few years before I went there. There really was nothing like it. But the the, the effect it had on people, the influence and its legacy was why it still remains. Because it, it closed in '97, we all thought that was it, unaware that Peter Hook had quietly registered the name, thinking you never know what's going to happen in the future. The rest of New Order thought he was crazy. Why? That club has cost us millions. It's best gone. Early 2000s, people started putting on Hacienda nights. Because uh, Ricky, be a Ricky, hang on a minute, I own that name. So he put a stop to them. And that's when Tony Wilson's son, Oliver Wilson, approached me and said, I want to put Hacienda night on. So we need to talk to Ricky. And we did, me and Mike got back together on the decks for the first time. Because Mike um, stopped DJing and Hacienda in 92, where he went on to do MP play. So we haven't actually DJ together since 92. So can you imagine 2002, there was a Hacienda night. At the, uh, I think it was, uh, it was in Manchester. I can't remember where it was. Um, I think it's called the Old Two now or something. On Oxford Road. There was people Prince. like, what? Prince. That's it. People couldn't believe this was happening. And it was massive. And that's when Peter Hook said, oh, maybe we should do more Hacienda nights. So the odd night over the past 20 years has grown into um, regular nights. Where maybe we do the warehouse projects for, for, for a while. Festivals, we do stages at festivals. Um, we did our 10th, uh, the 10th year after, no, the 10th, no, the 30th birthday in the car park underneath Hacienda Apartment and Hacienda Classical. We started doing that in 2016. So I think it's this enduring appeal. People met their life partners. People, well, somebody, more than one person told me that their child was conceived in the Hacienda. Whoa. Um, that's the type of effect. People, people started going to Hacienda, realized that they wanted to get divorced, and then met someone else. You know, it's all this like, um, it, if you were like in your late teens or early 20s, and um, don't forget, late 80s Britain was a pretty grim place. Thatcher government, um, lots of industrial action, lots of strikes, high inflation. What oh, sounds a bit familiar, isn't it? But 15% inflation. I remember my, my, my first mortgage rate was about 12.5%. I mean, people mourn it now about 2%, two percent anyway. Um, it was a grim. Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, Glasgow, all these like modern, thriving European metropolises that we all know and love today, Bristol as well, were pretty grim, dark, dingy places. Um, and so the Hacienda is there, this shining, gleaming industrial um, layout designed by Ben Kelly with Peter Savile's artwork to promote it, an ecstasy, an acid house. Nobody cares, there's no dress code. People were told that they made too much of an effort to get in. You don't have to dress up to get in here. And you had barristers dancing next to football hooligans, next to hairdressers, next to doctors. Everyone off their heads. That's why, you know, people have a lot of love for it. But a new generation read about it, hear these stories, and can't believe that it actually happened. It did happen. Bizarrely, I get people come to me Said, I wish I was born 40 years ago. I like, know you don't. Trust me. It starts to happen. He's off. Anyway. But they say, no, I wouldn't want to witness that's the end of this Haiti. And I think, well, actually, yeah, I would have loved to have been in, you know, San Francisco in the late 60s, but I wasn't, but I know about it. Um, and 
I think that's why it has that enduring or endearing effect. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm in my 50s and I get to DJ to people who used to go to Hacienda and people who were, weren't even born when it got locked down. I just still do the same thing, play music I love and people who love the music I play. So that's my Yeah, I think it's a big reason why I moved to Manchester. No, but the there's lots of people I know uh, who chose to go to Manchester University or one of the Manchester universities to do a degree because Hacienda was there. But similarly, a few years later, people were doing that with Liverpool and Cree as well. Um, but there's like people I know who stayed in Manchester and who made their life in Manchester because of Hacienda. So you mentioned Hacienda Classical, and that, that's been a phenomenal success. You've taken that around the UK alongside... Um, Manchester Camerata Orchestra, um, Peter Hook and, and guests, and vocalists who've been doing both classical and contemporary tunes with that. So how did the idea come about and why do you think it's connected so well? Well, the idea came about in 2015 um, at one of those nights where it was doing my head in. It was a great night and I was doing my head in the American people were like, ah, I can't get some proper classics on. It's like, wow. Just dance, you know. There was a minority, and in, in the hotel bar at like three or four in the morning, thinking, we're trying to come up with a way of keeping this kind of club, a particular club, happy, and throwing some ideas around with a guy called Paul Fletcher, who is the Hacienda manager. And then, as we were told, we had to clear the bar because we're setting off for breakfast. Went to the elevator, lift elevator. And the doors open, it's five in the morning, and two musicians with their, you know, musical instruments in their cases got out. And we got in the lift. And I, and I can't remember if it was me or Fletch said, that's what we should do. Some kind of classical thing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be ridiculous, right? And as the lift went up and we got to our floor, we went, no, that's, let's do it, let's do it. And, it, and we did it as a one-off. Uh, February 2016, just over six years ago, it was a one-off in Manchester, and it was awful because nobody could hear the orchestra. We really thought at the Bridgewater Hall, passing the classical, people would come along, sit there, and listen. No, no, no. They got absolutely rat arsed in the bar. <laughs> they were dropping hills, right? It was like a wall of sound from the audience. So, because we sold out so quickly, we did it a week later anyway. So we had a week to put it right, and we did. And the second week was incredible. And then the Royal Albert Hall say we want to put it on. Then the Dome in Brighton, we want to put it on. Then the Festival in Lancashire, we want to put it on. So that one-off became 20 shows. And then after four shows, I remember vividly, I'm in the, doing my thing on the decks of the Brighton Dome. Four songs in, and I'm like, this is shit. This, is, this was supposed to be one-off. This is the fourth show, and I think... It could be way better. But we once you score and arrange everything and do all the non-classical stuff, that's it. You can't change. It's not like a DJ set where you make it up as you go along. So we had to see the year out. And then I said to Cookie, are we doing it again? Because yeah, we're doing it again next year. It has to be a new show. And we didn't want to do a new show because it costs money to score and arrange everything. But I stuck to my guns and said, okay, let's do it. In 2017, when we did Glastonbury, we opened the Pyramid Stage at Glastonbury, I still can't believe it. It was a much better show, 10 times better show. And then as it's gone on year after year, I think it's got better. But as this year, it's a new show, new songs. Obviously, some songs could bring back because, you know, there's certain, certain songs you just got to do. And it's really exciting. And then the, the irony is, I gave up playing in a band to be a DJ. And now, I sing with Hacienda the Classical, which is like going back to what I did for the DJ, although on a much bigger scale, you know. <laughs> so, so did you have and did you have to go and do all the practices with the DJ and the whole orchestra? Or... No, because you can't have a rehearsal because the I love the Manchester camera and they're brilliant. But in the world in the rock and roll slash electronic world, should we have a rehearsal? Yeah, great, let's do it. Let's see where it goes. Manchester Camerata. Yeah, we can do rehearsal. 
and you've got to pay MU rates, haven't you? So it costs as much to put a rehearsal on with the orchestra as it does to put a show on. So you don't rehearse. Okay, so me, the team, the choir, and the singers, we rehearse, but we haven't got the orchestra. The orchestra turn up on the day, on the sound check, they've got their score, nail it every time, it's unbelievable. And it means that our first time we did it, we didn't know to the sound check at the first show whether or not it was going to work. Wow. And it did, though. They're, they're amazing, honestly, they're amazing. And just to be on stage, with four singing classical musicians in front of me, a choir to my right, the singers come on and say, Peter Hook, so that's, I'm, not, I'm in a band with Peter Hook. If you said that to me in 1984, I wouldn't have believed you. I'm in a band with Peter Hook. Right. So, um, what are the plans for singing the classical going forward? Well, we're, our first show this year is 13th of May, we're at Hall, 8th of July, Manchester, we're also in Hastings, Milton Keynes. Uh, Burnley, Glasgow, more shows to be announced soon. And I'm singing again. Fantastic. I won't tell you what though. So I just want to round off with a, a few questions um, uh, on, on you. So um, you've covered so many bases in the music industry. Do you have like a, a purpose or a, a guiding philosophy that you want to go into every day? Do I have a purpose? <laughs> <laughs> No one's ever asked me that before. I think my wife once asked me that once, but she's really annoyed at me. Um, do I have a purpose? My purpose, like I said earlier, is just to play good music and share with people. And I, I love going, have you heard this? That's what, that's what I do. On what I've, got. I've got a breakfast show, which um, I foolishly agreed to in lockdown because I was one of the excluded because I got zero financial support from the government, right? And then when I got off of this breakfast show playing hip hop, uh, I, 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 before house, I used to play low, I still love hip hop. Um, to be able to, to be on the radio every morning and play Eric B and Rakeem, Gangstar and Beastie Boys, brilliant. Um, but also my house, my weekly house show, along with house radio show, available on all platforms every Friday. That's about you playing amazing new music I love, but also digging out stuff people have forgotten about. I think that's my purpose, just to play great music and share that experience with like-minded people. One of my, one of my sons is suddenly, from being, oh, dad, you're so cringy, oh, dad, you're embarrassing, all our friends at school follow you on social media, he suddenly decided he, he came to two gigs and wants to be a DJ. What? So there's a little project, a little side project. He's Amazing. quite good, you know. Excellent. And that's not a dad talking, right? He's actually, I said, before I give you lessons, Ben, so I go and put some playlists together. So two weeks later, I said, why are you getting this up and listen to the Lowe's House music? I love it. I really love it. So okay, give me a couple of examples of songs, right? The first one he said was Good Life in a City. Well, that's a good start. But, you know, that's a pretty obvious one. And he goes, yeah, and I also like Romantini. What? Romantini? And I'm really impressed with that. But then, he is my son, right? <laughs> hey, we'll see. Watch this space. I'm not, if you, I'm not pushing him to do it. If he wants to, to do it, I've also got a massive record collection. He's welcome to it. You're going to take on uh, that girl soon. Maybe. <laughs> He's a good looking chap as well. Sounds great. <laughs> that is a dad talk. Six foot two. So, um, has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for? So what, sorry? Has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for success? Failure? Well, yeah. the, the, the only failure I've had was kind of late nineteen, late late nineteen nineties, kind of pre, just when the internet was young. I had this idea of doing like an online global radio station and got investors and people involved. It was just too early. Of course, now, anyone with a laptop can go and set up their own global radio station this afternoon. But it was, I lost a lot of money on that because it was like putting money in and getting the building, getting the infrastructure, the technology. And then as we're beavering away and doing it, the, the internet suddenly got really big and faster and dial-up stopped and it was all about broadband and then everyone could do it and suddenly, damn, that's gone. 
So that's the only thing. But what did I learn from that? Nothing really. I tried and, it, and I messed it up. Um, and then, to, and then, and then, you know, what I did learn from that was maybe don't spend as much as you earn. Keep something to one side. Which was, it was a very harsh lesson in 2008 in the financial crash because promoters were out of business, comps were out of business. And I realised that all my income was from uh, clubs and radio. Thank God I got the radio and then I lost all my radio contracts. Uh, harsh lesson there, but I learned because in lockdown I had zero income, but I'd learned from 2008, so I had money put aside. If that's one bit of advice, give your kids, put money aside for a reading day. Or a pandemic. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, but you know, but the thing is, you learn from mistakes, right? I, what I used to hate as a teenager or as a young man was people giving you advice that you didn't ask for. Tell you what you should do, Graham. And I'd go, oh, what? And it would just, I would just go, yeah, whatever. I wouldn't listen to it, right? Now, if someone asks me for advice, I'll happily give that advice, but. Even now, I'm in my 50s, and when someone starts giving me advice, I was like, what I want to say is, why don't you just, I'm not interested. I, I've got advice to give if, if people ask, because I've learned from my own mistakes. And, and if I will, if I, okay, I'll give you some advice. Learn from your mistakes, then that's the best way, I think, to lead your life. And you have such fun on the way. I lose a lot of money. <laughs> but you meet some great people. <laughs> And you get some great stories to tell. But I do tell my kids good money to them, so I do. <laughs> so, um, do, do you have a, an absurd um, habit or a strange thing that you love doing? You would say is an absurd habit? Habit. Yeah. Let's just get my wife on the phone and ask her. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure I'll probably do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm untidy and noisy and fidget too much and play music too often and too loud. But that's not really annoying. No, um, I tell you, I like to relax, and I've been doing this since the early 90s. I still do it now. Despite having knee replacement surgery on this knee three years ago, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to have it on this one in the next few months, I am up at the crack of dawn, hail, rain, or shine, winter, summer, daylight, darkness, on my mountain bike, tearing off road through woods. I fucking love it. And in lockdown, I was doing it every other morning without fail. And it's just where I get all my ideas and um, clear my head and, and everything. I, I, I love it. I've got all several mountain bikes. That's my kind of passion. I did, but going back to the days when I just spent everything I earned, I did, <laughs> I did race in the Formula Ferrari Classic Series in a classic Ferrari. Then we had twins, and I've realized that I couldn't afford to. So I have twins and a classic Ferrari that cost several thousand pounds a year to, to maintain. Um, my bike is better anyway, better for the environment, better for your physical health and your mental health. Is it? Have you got the electric one? No. Um, people keep saying, oh, Parky, you're getting on now, you need to get an electric bike. No, I don't want an electric bike. I, I see young men, I'm going up a hill, you know, decent tangent, like really going for it in a very low gear. And then some lad, normally, without a helmet on, on his phone, no hands, with a fag in his mouth, will go flying past me on his electric bike. And I go, that looks shit. <laughs> it does, though. I think it does. So you've got to, I like to get the lungs going. You know. Nice. I'm, I'm just pleased after my past that I can still go out and do 50, 60 kilometers and get back before my wife's up at the weekend, yeah. So um, you mentioned that you um, you hate people giving you advice um, who didn't ask for it. I mean, I, I, I have asked for advice, and, I, and that's fine. But it's like yeah. when someone half your age, when you're in the middle of an Indian set, and some ha someone half your age who you've never heard of, but has got more social media followers and really shit clothes on, tells you that this button will do this. I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Let me press the button and find out. You know what I mean? So, what, have you got examples of bad recommendations that you hear in relation to being a DJ? Um, I don't listen. Any time anyone has ever given me any DJ advice, I just don't listen. Because when I right, tell you what, when I first heard a record called um, "Lessons One, Two, and Three by Double D and Steinsky, 
where is edited, right? I thought it was done live. It's cut, it's edited. But I managed to almost recreate that as closely as, as I could on decks that weren't even Technics decks. And then somebody said, well, if you had Technics decks, it'd be much easier. But anyway, it's an edit. What? What? That's the only bit of advice. Well, not even advice. That was just someone telling me someone I didn't know. Um, I just... Any DJ advice? I mean, I remember Roger Sanchez once trying to tell me something. I'm like, who are you? No, I didn't. I said, yeah, okay, Roger, you just concentrate on your game. I just concentrate on my own game. And if I make a mistake, great. If I learn something by accident, great. It's, 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 when you learn something by accident, I mean, my new iPhone, I learned something by accident on the train this morning. Oh, my God, that's amazing. I love it more if you learn it by, by accident. But I've just... The reason advice is great if you ask for it, but I just like to concentrate on my own game. Um, I'm aware of what's going on around me. I'm aware of what people are doing. Fine, let them get on with it. But I honestly would rather just concentrate on what I'm doing. And after 38 years of doing it, and still doing it, but I like to think I might be doing something right. I don't know. But I mean, I, I still enjoy it. Honestly, next weekend, Thursday night hall, Friday daytime London, Friday night time London, Saturday evening Blackburn, Sunday afternoon Manchester, Sunday night Liverpool. Can't wait. Plus, if I've had no gigs this year, so that's the thing. But you know, <laughs> but no, I really can't wait for next weekend. Six gigs across four days. And the, and Houston's closed. Wow. You know what I mean? But I'd be fine. I know, it's a bloody nightmare. Um, I've got one last question for you. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you for this afternoon. Um, if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, metaphorically speaking, um, get a message out to, to millions or billions, what would you have on it? See, I know about these things. The battery's got right. Gigantic billboard. You can't ask any more questions now. No. The, so, gigantic billboard. I've got three answers to that. Um, one, I probably wouldn't want a gigantic billboard because, like I said earlier, I just concentrate on one game. But if I had to have one, when I was get, when I got a taxi from Bristol Temple Meads to here, God, billboards just try and sell you shit, stuff you don't need. So what I would do, I would have a billboard that either said, um, pay attention, enjoy yourself and have fun, or I'd have the Ukrainian flag with no more war on it. 